Casey, I wish you would give me a little heads up on the, the live stream recording so I could do my hair and makeup. <laughs> but here we are. So I'm Josh Mackey. I'm one of the uh, district HR directors. Uh, we're going to talk to you today about HCM and we'll give you a little more information about what that is. But I also want to introduce the gentlemen that are with me. So I'm going to themselves. Um, I'm Carl Ward. I'm the district director of business applications and compliance. Christian Henry, charge of communications and change management for the HCM project. All right, so. So, and then we have a camera running in the back. I just wanted to check. Um, can we, can everybody yeah, we're ready to go. In the back? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have a, a pretty short show here. I think it's about a dozen slides or so, but really, you know, our overall. Um, with several goals, but the main thing is to give you answers to any questions you might have that we have the answers to at this point, um, and to get a little bit of feedback from you on a couple of things. So uh, yeah, we have a, a, a fairly brief presentation, and then we'll have hopefully some pretty good uh, discussion with some Q and A at the end. So uh, let's jump into it. So first of all, um, this term HCM. So that might be a new term for most of us. Probably is. Um, so we want to start from the very beginning, and what is HCM? So HCM stands for Human Capital Management. Um, in our terminology, it's HRMS. It's the exact same thing. It's just a new set of letters to talk about the same thing. So um, we've always referred to our human resources um, information system as HRMS. That's kind of a legacy terminology for us. We've always called it. Um, when we moved over to Oracle and PeopleSoft, they called it um, Human Capital Management. But we kind of held on to our, our old terminology in HRMS. So with this project and uh, this kind of transformation in the way we're going to be doing the system, we decided um, it was time to go ahead and adopt the, the language and terminology and the naming um, that everybody else used when referring to this uh, project and set of tools. Um, so we see. So you, they're interchangeable terms. You'll hear us throw them around. Um, but if you, if you need to do a translation in your, in your own mind, um, HCM equals HRMS. Exact same thing. Um, it's just a uh, new set of letters. You can see there across the bottom the type of modules that are contained in the system. So it's the payroll, time and labor, benefits, absence management, um, our core HR recruiting, um, some learning applications that we have in there for employees as well. So it's all the um, employee based administrative systems. So why are we doing this project? Um, and you can see that our, our tagline of the project really is stabilization and modernization. So um, we've got a whole set of activities around stabilization, and we have a whole other set of activities around modernization. So, uh, and we'll talk to you a little bit about some specifics in those, but those are really the drivers for what we're doing. Um, that's major stability concerns and issues um, throughout the life of our product and our project. Um, and then we're looking to modernize and take advantage of new technologies and functionality within the system to get more um, efficient and So goals. We have five major goals for the project. Um, first and foremost is number one, and fix, it's fixed payroll production. This is the, the key core stability issue that we have in the system. Um, over the years, we have um, done a lot of customization. I started off with talking about HCM versus HRMS, so we kind of held on to our old way of naming the system. We've also held on to our old way of utilizing the systems and processes. So um, since our implementation, we've done a lot of customization of our HRIS system to make it um, kind of act and behave as much as we could like our old system. Um, over the years, that's created numerous issues for us, um, and a lot of those fall in that kind of stability category. So we're going to um, fix and get uh, stable payroll. Um, we're going to implement a brand new module for us that we've um, had in our system since we went live in 98 that we've never utilized or turned on. Um, it's called Absence Management. So uh, that's where we'll do a lot of uh, functionality like uh, reporting vacation time, um, sick leave, uh, kind of leave of absence, like family medical leave, et cetera. Uh, we do that now in the system, but we do it in a very customized uh, kind of workaround type of way. Uh, we're going to go to the delivery product and use the system as it's designed to do. Um, yet another overall goal of our project is to reduce extensive customization and go to more of the delivery product. The, the, the Oracle PeopleSoft HR module <coughs> system is really built on um, industry-wide best practice, um, HR best practices uh, across the world, not just the country, but um, so we're going we're to 
to utilize those as designed if wherever possible. We're still going to have a degree of customization because we do some things that are just truly unique to Maricopa and there's, there's not really any uh, alternative or best practice way to do it. So we'll need to maintain some of those. Just to give you a sense, right now we have about 70% um, customized. We're about 70% customized in our system um, and only using the system about 30% as delivered. Uh, so we're going to try to, to at the very least shift those numbers, flip them. Um, and then you, even our goal would be to even move more towards um, less customization all the way around. So uh, we really want to take advantage of the system as it's designed. Uh, we really are, are missing out on a lot of the advantages of the system, a lot of the integrated uh, capabilities of the system. As we move through uh, this project, the new um, FMS project, hopefully you guys are all familiar with, FMS and the Hyperion BDS project, um, and then the recent uh, upgrade we did for um, our student information system, the CS9 project. Those are all now on the Oracle platform. So again, more opportunity to have data integrated, shared across systems, um, and flow more freely back and forth. So, uh, but when we have it highly customized, we're able to take advantage of kind of those delivered integrations and uh, features of the system. I already mentioned about the standardizing business processes and really adopting best practices there. And uh, data governance. So that's governance <coughs> is about, um, like I said, as the systems become more integrated, it's, it's much more crucial that we are very thoughtful and deliberate about how we do share information across systems. Um, understand that a change to a record maybe in HR that might affect something in FMS or something that happens to a, in the SIS system or around somebody that's also in the HR system. What does that mean for that data kind of reconciling and going across systems? We've got to be very coordinated between all of our um, district-wide systems to make sure uh, we're, we're maximizing our own. So real high level, that's kind of what we're trying to accomplish. The way we're going to accomplish it or the timeline we set for this project, um, you can kind of see where we are right now um, towards the end of spring. Um, all our efforts right now are focused on our release one, which is highly um, focused, really focused on payroll. Uh, we've broken this project in into several releases, a little bit different approach. In the past, we've done major system upgrades. We kind of do all the work, and then at some magic date in the future, we flip the switch and we're you know, out of the old environment into the new environment. With this project, we're really going to take an iterative approach. And we're going to take a little bait. We're going to have kind of baby switch flipping. We're doing eight different types of major releases scheduled. So we're going to try to take advantage of uh, the stability and the uh, modernization capabilities um, sooner, quicker, and smaller chunks so that it's more. Um, palatable in terms of everything that everybody else has going on, um, but that uh, mainly that we're able to get um, take advantage and gain some of the benefits sooner. So our first release is going to happen this summer, um, and then you can see the other scheduled releases all the way throughout the two-year life cycle of the project. Um, we don't have we haven't nailed in the exact date for summer yet. Um, we do obviously know we're working closely with all the other projects that are going around. Um, systems, and we know that FMS is going live on July 6th. July 6th, and um, this HCM release one will go after that. So, um, sometime in the summer, um, when it makes the most sense based on um, that project's timeline, um, and other factors such as the beginning of the academic year, etc. So, um, so we're probably looking at landing somewhere between July 6th and the beginning of the academic year. So, a question. <coughs> Oh, I'm sorry. FMS stands for Financial Management System. So it's it's the system that's replacing CFS. Yes. Sorry, a lot of a lot of alphabet soup for a lot of letters. Right? FMS is July 6th. Yeah, FMS is July 6th. And Carl is actually a project manager lead on that, so we can um, speak to that. I'm actually going to turn it over to Carl right now to talk a little bit about some details of this release, and then when we get into the Q and A, we can talk about whatever uh, pieces of HCM or FMS. So, as Josh said, we're breaking it down into multiple releases, and the first release is to talk about payroll. And primarily to focus on stabilization of payroll. So, I'll share with you that a couple of times within the past year or so, we've come this close to not being able to produce payroll in our company. Because we had so many customizations and so many errors, we delayed our system and we couldn't find So, that's why we are, are focusing on payroll and essentially approached 
we have to deal with hair and so it's not really an actor in hair. Um, so the other things that will come with payroll and as we work and build the data together is that we'll be able to report much more accurately. As we roll forward with FMS, and you'll also remember that we talked about the carbon restructure and release one. It's going to help us be able to tie employee costs to actual expenses across the two systems so you get a much better budget number out of what you would have been spending for your particular area of the department of college. Um, it's going to help us track our shifts and do calculations better of punch time and release time, not necessarily punch time, but cost of time reporting. Um, a lot of our customization is built around the scheduling and the way that we uh, calculate time, so those will go away. It will help us with resource planning. We'll also be doing a lot more with the delivered workflow in payroll. Right now, all of our workflow in the system is in test one, but the application itself has a very robust workflow engine that we're going to start leveraging and using. Um, for um, time and labor, we're going to change a lot of the way the codes work and start building the foundation for happiness management, which will come in the release too. Um, I think Josh mentioned a little bit, it talks about absence management helps us report our vacation time, our sick time, helps calculate that in the way. Right now, most of that is done manually. And so it's going to help that a lot to make it much much easier to manage and direct. Just one thing we forgot to mention when we started is we'll make this uh, presentation available to you all. So I know there's people, <coughs> feel free to take notes and everything, but we will make sure you know that you'll get a copy of this slide as well. One area that's been a little um, iffy, I mean, not iffy, but confusing is comp time. <laughs> Are you going to touch about, on that? Let me come talk about comp time specifically right now. Okay. So comp time has been, for you and for everybody in the district, a nightmare. <laughs> um, it lets you do negative comp time, it throws comp time into place, the comp time should fit in there. And that is due specifically to several customizations that have linked into payroll that we haven't been able to fix. So as we go with release one in the summer, comp time will be fixed. So we're going to be making some changes to comp time. So the changes that will be coming are also tied to CPD. Um, comp time will no longer expire for our employees. The cap will remain in place at 120 hours. Employees will have the opportunity to pay out on time on a, on a requested basis through the timesheet and through absence management. And then we'll also make sure that all of the balances are synced for our release one the line. Does that help? On time has been a mess. And that's addressed in release one. Just so you guys know, too, I don't know how many of you know Carl and I. So Carl is um, the whole entire payroll area reports up to Carl. Carl is really driving uh, release one and a, a huge part of release two. So you may be the person to talk to you about what's happening with comp time. So. so the other thing that we'll do in release one and release two is to look at how we handle garnishments and levies, those types of things. Much of that's been customized as well, but we're not the only ones in the world that have to do garnishments. So we're moving back to the other functionality. Um, it's also going to help us do much more auditing. So things that we need to provide to our state auditors or to federal auditors, we're not able to because of the way the system has been set up and used. So that's going to put all of that back in place. Okay. So this is how this is impacting. So I know that there's tons of questions. So as we move with release one and payroll, most of that is going to be behind the scenes and won't be, big, won't be visible to us as end users. A lot of it has to deal with the way that things are calculated, the procedure with which they're calculated with. Um, we're streamlining a lot of functionality that has been available that we've decided to change. And I can give you an example of that. For some reason, we've decided at Maricopa sometime in the past, in the history, that we could calculate FICA tax much better than anybody else in the United States. <laughs> so we have customized the FICA tax deduction program. The first thing will be pulled out and we'll put in the limit. So, what that also means for us is that as we embrace new technology that's released from Oracle, it's going to be much easier for us to leverage it and implement it. For time and labor, there are going to be some minor changes. Things that we are supposed to be doing today that we don't do today, 
that they'll be in four steps to go forward. So, for instance, <laughs> um, as non essential employees, we're supposed to be recording our time and submitting it for approval. That's going to become a much stronger requirement, and we'll default those hours in from the schedule that has been set up for the employee, and then they'll make any changes that they need to. So they'll record a change for vacation or sick leave or comp time, and then submit to their supervisor for approval. Oh, can you use the mic? It's because Josh is so much taller than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a question? Nope. Okay. So the other thing with time itself is that right now we find that only 30% of our supervisors approve their employees' time. And we take a tremendous hit with the auditors every year we get So going forward, we are looking at slowly enforcing so to begin with, we'll create a new series of queries and audits that will be sent to the college presidents of the supervisors that have not approved time so that they can work with their staff and we'll go ahead and auto-approve that time. Right now, we auto-approve and pay everything regardless. So that may be tightening as we go forward. Okay. I, I might be getting ahead of me, but with all of this taking place in um, the summer, what about our um, job hire docs and special assignments? Are they going to this Oracle platform as well? They, they're already on the Oracle platform and they're scheduled for a later release. So, so let, let me clarify that question. That's one that we've done a few times. So um, we're not changing platforms. We're currently on, we currently use the HCM, we just call HR. Um, so this is not a brand new product for us. Like, like CFS to FMS, that's a brand new product. CFS was, was a totally separate product um, and we're going to the Oracle platform. We're just um, we calibrating ourselves on our current product. Um, and at some point in this process, at release four, you we'll go back to this timeline later, but at release four it includes an upgrade to the newest version. So we're on version 9.1 right now. We'll go to version 9.2 um, at the and we release four or five of, of our of our project. But it's the same same product. It's going to look largely the same. There are going to be some differences in terms of what we're required to do with those things. And then when we go to the upgrade on, on the 9.2, of course, there might be some other um, kind of look and feel type of things. But it's the same product that we've been using um, since 1998. So we've been on various versions of this product all the way through. <laughs> a lot of people are asking that question in terms of is this a brand new thing? So it's, it is not. So, so can we? go ahead and put in our job hire docs for July 1 on, or do we need to wait until you look? Absolutely, you can, you can keep going forward. <laughs> no restrictions. <laughs> um, so is it going to be, like in the time and labor side of it, is it going to be more real time than it currently is? Because you know, like if you make a change in, as a manager in there, it doesn't show up and you're never sure if the real change took place or not at that time. Absolutely. So the other thing that we're doing is changing the way that the process is run behind the scenes that updates all that data. Right now they're scheduled very far and through between. We're addressing that schedule for the two months and for three months. And the reason that happens is because of the way it's set up. It takes a while for those refreshes to happen and all those things. So um, because as Carl mentioned earlier, we have stuff customized and things are looking for things in places they're not, it takes more time to go around. But then one example we had early on is one of our security processes that has to go when, you, when you're searching for an employee, for example. Um, one, of, one of the parts of that process currently requires the system to, to, to look through 1.3 million rows. Literally, 1.3 million rows. Um, already through our assessment and looking at, at a, a more delivered process, um, they've been able to get that down to looking at three rows. So from 1.3 million to three. Um, so right there, you can you can think about how, like even a computer, having to kind of do all that and, and moving through, and thinking about the stability um, opportunities for errors and things like that. So um, you should see a whole lot of those kind of performance type things. They'll be uh, much more kind of user friendly, real time, etc. So um, as we get better and more efficient in the system, um, we're hoping to kind of condense some of those lead times and things we need to. So um, we'll be trying to adjust deadlines and those kind of things where we can to give everybody more time where we can. If the system's more efficient, more effective, more stable, we probably won't need as much time to do all the cleanup and the, the things we have to do behind the scenes once once it gets you know kind of close for payroll, et cetera. So um, stay tuned for all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and 
The other thing that we're looking at with time and labor, I've mentioned quickly, is uh, workflow. So today you get you don't get notifications when your employees submit time. So we're looking at getting that put into place so that you know when your employees are done, when they submit their time, so that you know that it's out there waiting for your work. Then your work class will be built and it's waiting for you to take action. That's so my thing is on the uh, schedule, you know, we put a weekly schedule in there. And right now, the employees do not clock in and out, other than the other than the team on time. So, is in, there's how is that changing? So in the future, if you're uh, not in time, you are not in time. Yes, you'll be required to enter your hours. It's called positive time reporting, and the hours will default from the schedule that's been built for you. So if they know that you're supposed to work eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, it will pop that into your time for you automatically. You make any adjustments and submit them. Right, right now, the way that's working, so the, the schedules you guys know, that you put your schedule in and you get an email every summer, like when those summer hours, put your new summer schedule in, etc. So what, what we have right now is customization of the system to turn that, fun that functionality right now doesn't feed anything. It records it and it's a placeholder, so we can always go back and look at schedules if we need to and have them recorded. But it doesn't feed your pay or your schedules or anything or your, your absences and those things. We've turned that off customization and we do that in a different way. So in the future, we'll turn that on. It will default based on what you put in that schedule. We'll feed over to the right place where it's supposed to feed in and then you'll make adjustments to it. So we think we've had. Um, I have a question in regards to the comp time. Currently, right now, a lot of managers are tracking comp time separately outside of HR and it's tracking throughout spreadsheets. They have to. So who's manually going to be inputting that? The managers? Or? So what we'll do is call for all those spreadsheets in, and we'll programmatically load all of that data into the employee record. Then we also have a, a very strong consultant in Bob Perry that's already looked at the code to rebalance and make sure that everybody's comp time balance is accurate and correct. So you'll be getting much more information about that as we move forward. Over here. So right now managers, of course, are the approvers, but we have up to two approvers, alternates, and I think three timekeepers. Is that going to change, or would that be the same? That should be the same. And you can also delegate your approval and open your work list, so you'll have lots of opportunity to make sure everybody gets it. And so that may change. So it should be the same. It'll, if anything, it'll be it'll give you more flexible. So I won't say it's going to that exact same rule is going to be there. But you may have opportunity to do additional designees, etc. But but you'll have the opportunity to have. So. Okay. And one more question on the comp time. So if they already use their comp time before we move to the upgrade, do we still turn in those sheets? Yep. So we're, we're working out all of those details. But if you have a comp time worksheet that you've been tracking that has zero balances. I can't imagine that we would call for that back in. We would just adjust what's already in the system reported for. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my question was about the positive time reporting, which, which you said is going to be implemented. That's going to be for uh, full-time staff. Um, yeah, so that's so that's uh, full-time non exempt So so let me yes, verify that. So that's everybody that's that's uh, in our uh, board group. Everybody doesn't touch time. Uh, it's not an adjunct. Um, that's uh, so MAP and CEC, America Open Specially Funded Equivalent, are considered exempt, meaning they're exempt from the FLSA, Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, which may, basically means they don't get overtime. So if you're in a position, the type of position that, that um, makes you eligible for overtime, then you'll be doing a positive time report. And that's the main function of it, is to make sure that when you get to those hours where you're eligible for overtime, that all the systems and processes kick in, that you receive that overtime um, or, or designate as comp time accurately. So that's the delivered way the system's built. Um, that's the way that everybody else pretty much in the world utilizes it. So we've done customization to make everybody, we call an exception time reporter, um, which is the way that everybody's doing that. The only reporting, it's assumed that you have a, a, your standard 40 hours in and any adjustments um, that you're not here, exception time reporting, that's what you're doing. So, so that's the move to the positive time reporting. We'll put in, the, the system will be by your schedule. You'll affirm that. That's kind of the big change. You'll affirm that and make any changes to the time. Um, so follow up question. What about for RPS staff? Is there is there a, a schedule set for that? Those in those in the planning group or don't remain punch. Don't remain punch on there. What? 
question was a couple of years ago we had looked at to try to do some flex scheduling within a two week time period and it became a slight customization. We couldn't do it because one week could be overtime and then the next week could be short short hours. Is that Are you talking about a 980 yeah, alternative nine schedule kind of? Yeah. Um, yeah, so all those alternative schedules will be options from the system, the system to handle those things. We just need to, to come to agreement as a district how we're going to handle it. I really like the 980. Yeah, so those alternative schedules are part of the things that we're working with the policy groups to, to get um, alignment and agreement on the program. But the system will be able to accommodate it, so saying the system won't be able to accommodate it, which is part of our, our issue now, uh, that barrier will be removed. Um, I know that you said we were only using like maybe 30%. Will blended overtime and revisions be built into that? Like, I know we have been utilizing that, but will those two items be addressed in the processing and HC? You can see the HR people that all the, all the, all the back end stuff, right? Um, so, so blend over time is something that we're we're reviewing right now. We don't we don't have an answer for you. That I don't think that's that's kind of locked in, but it's definitely on our requirements list that we're evaluating. That's one of the things too, kind of general caveat. Okay, we're going to answer any questions we can today, and we hope we've got most of the answers. But we are still, um, we're just kicking off our design phase, so we kind of gathered requirements and identified where our gaps are in those things, but we're still um, in the, we haven't really, this week we're kicking off some design sessions um, to know kind of some of the solutions, but some things we know for sure just based on, on how it's delivered and those things, so um, that's one that we had solution <laughs> totally. Will that be an option for us to handle? Well, at least when they change, they'll still be mad. Mm -hmm. I have actually based on a per 980 thing. Does that mean, like, if we have an event one week, like this week we're spent, we've got several events this week, that people could work more this week over the 25 and then less next week as long as it's in the same payroll period? Is that what that means? You're talking two, two separate things here. So the, the, the part-time limits and the 25 hours per week and, and the rules related to ACA and those things are totally separate from what we're talking about with okay. full-time employee schedules. That's when we get, that's like a really simple thing, right? It seems pretty basic, but that's a kind of, that's a question we've gotten, we've had, it was our second town hall, so we were already at Scottsdale, and then we had uh, the session today, and then in between we met with a couple leaders, but that question about the comments not, not showing right, is something that's obviously causing a lot of the comments could be a little more evident, because they're, they're just in that little circle, yeah. and that probably won't change, that's still the problem. There are rounding rules, and we can look at refining them and making them a little, a little clearer. But rounding is, is something that every institution gets. And actually, that's one of the things that I believe we're utilizing fairly delivered uh, is their standard rounding right. rules right now. So. But it's, I mean, it is something we have a little bit of control over. It's I think the confusion comes from punch time to pay time. Yes. And it doesn't round consistently. So I think what we can do. We can have it show the pay time rounds instead of the punch time rounds so they know exactly what to expect on their payments. That's a question and issue. Yes. <laughs> you answered my question. The showing the, the, the pay time on the timesheet would be wonderful. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> you are on camera and here's the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you have to make sure I'm not. <laughs>
particularly around what we call the 260, 261, 262 <coughs> days. So what Maricopa has decided to do is take the number of actual days within a calendar year that should be paydays and change it every year, depending on how many paydays there are that day or how many actual work days there are. Most companies say, you get paid 260 and then divide it out. And so that's why our checks fluctuate so much, is because it calculates those changes every day. But the, the another, I guess, more answer to your question directly is I would start with your college HR team just to review what what you think you're being paid for and what you think you should be being paid for. Um, and starting there, and if you do think there's some discrepancy, then follow up through them and, and they'll meet you with So you do have to be able to do is take the pay and offset it with your paycheck. Because that's what you're Are you a full-time employee? Yeah. <coughs> oh, 30 hours. Which should be fairly. Yeah. Yeah, which, uh, that I know, but there's one where it's the exact same hours and it was different. That very light. Where it was different <laughs> in, like, yeah. Because that's what I mean. Um, the way that the faculty read their paychecks, it looks like it's they're being calculated hours. So a lot of times, Hours aren't matching up to what we need. Is, is residential faculty or at, for all faculty, are their paychecks going to be a little bit different, viewable, with the hours being paid out? As we go through the whole calculation process and the way that it's being done, we're also looking at redesigning the paycheck so it's much more easy to read. And then, especially for adjunct faculty, they have multiple contracts to make sure that those are all listed out. We appreciate it. We'll, we'll have more time for Q&A. So Kristen is, is um, going to talk to us a little bit about what we're going to do in terms of communications and the change process. We mentioned earlier, we know there's a lot of stuff going on, um, and we know that there's a lot of projects and programs and different things going on out there. But we'll talk to you a little bit about, about how we're approaching this particular project um, and where we'll be, what we'll get around communication and change. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask this at the beginning of our session, but. Uh, didn't look so comfortable as having Josh on the shoulder. He was kind of on a roll there. <laughs> Pretend that uh, we haven't had the conversation that we did in the last half hour. And ask you two quick questions, if I may. Coming into this room, by a show of hands, how many of you knew what HCM stood for? Fantastic. Now it's a tough one, ready? How did you come by that knowledge? Where did you first hear, if you can recall, an explanation of the email. 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 The email inviting you to this meeting or the previous? Fantastic. The reason I ask that question is that um, as I've been spending time talking with folks in different capacities, <coughs> so you know I have worked on the SIS project as well. So in the course of doing that, I visited all the colleges and several occasions. Many people told me that they felt that they get too many combination of too many emails from the district and that they aren't specific enough. Um, which unfortunately they said led to the result of kind of the circular flock of many emails just kind of immediately got routed in certain places by Google so maybe they didn't get that. So Frank I was telling you I'm really glad to hear that people heard about the ACM project in an email and remembered some of the details that contained it. The reason that, that kind of information is important to us is we want to know how to communicate with you give you the information that you're interested in. I mean, I logged about 23 questions that we just were able to answer, and I think there's only two that we have a follow-up on that we couldn't give you an answer. We will do that. But we can't, the numbers just don't work for us to spend time having in a town hall with each group of people that want to get together and ask questions ad infinitum. We are going to continue the town halls all of May, all of June, and in the summer as well. Um, but obviously there's gonna be some people who for one reason or another, even if it's just their schedule, can't attend. So we're trying to find out, how can we find out from you what it is you want to learn more about, and how can we get those answers to you? I was gonna say, I don't think emails are as powerful as having conversations and discussions. And I think there was multiple ways that some of us heard about it. Email was one of them. Another one was, this is a pretty significant change and we need to know about it. And 
there's an awful lot of changes going on too, just like everybody else mentioned. SIS upgrade, uh, purchasing upgrade, this upgrade, and there's tons of other things happening. So I don't know the best way to get the message out, but there's multiple messages coming out. We are getting bombarded. So. Well, if, I, if you don't mind, can I ask you, you said that email is one way. Could you tell me, how did you hear about some of these things? Were there water cooler conversations? Um, I think there's water cooler conversations going on, but where I heard about it was at one of those leadership meetings, I believe, and it was our fancy car and full of that, which got the worst type of thing. So, uh, but I don't know how I got to hear about it. So, let me ask, uh, and I said two questions, I'm already on four, I think. Uh, <laughs> If we were to send out a survey to ask people what, how they would prefer to get these kinds of questions answered, would you be willing to take the 30 seconds to fill out that survey and hit submit and send it back to us? With the commitment from us that we will actually use those answers here. We're not going to ask you to fill out that survey and you waste your time. Right? So if you tell us you would rather go to a web page that has FAQs on it, then we'll put the answers there. If you tell us that you'd like to have a conversation like this but not to actually attend, and you'd like to be able to look in videos where other groups of people have asked questions and gotten answers, then we can do that. And we're happy to do multiple methods at the same time because we know that people have different communication preferences and styles. So if, if you will take the time, we will be glad to send you a short survey to kind of find out how we should break that down. We'll continue to send out the emails, that's fine. We'll continue to do the FAQs as well. But if there's a channel that people want to use, we want to make sure that we've got it down. Well, we have uh, our first example of it here, and hopefully this will go over well, and uh, we won't uh, let the little mustaches that people draw on our faces when we want it on YouTube. But <laughs> uh, the, the, the reason we have this up here, I just want to point out, is that this, the approach that we're taking here and sharing information with you about the project we hope it feels different than it has in the past. We hope that, to your point on some of the concerns around this being a large project, there being a lot of change associated with it. People need to know what's happening and know what their role is and how they'll be impacted by it. And that warrants a face-to-face -face conversation because each one of you is a stakeholder. Whether you use the HCM system, the currently HRMS, or whether, as you said, your really only interaction with it is when you get your paycheck. Nonetheless, you're affected by it. If payroll doesn't work, you would know about it, right? And, and therefore, you have a vested interest in it. So what we're trying to make sure that we do is hear from all the people who have payroll in this project, whether it's, as you said, as an end user of the system or just someone who derives a benefit from it. So part of the reason that we're having these town halls is to give people the opportunity to ask the questions they have, express whatever concerns they have, and start the process of understanding what will we need to do provide training. What we need to do so that when there are changes, people can be comfortable with those changes before the module goes live. Now for really swap, the payroll, as Carl said, uh, I think much better than I can, many of those changes are behind the scenes. For example, the change in the budget calculation. They'll show up on the pay paycheck and they'll be correct. It won't require any changes on your part. However, some of the other changes will. So where we do have changes like that, we want to make sure that we let people know what those changes are well in advance. Uh, the folks at Scottsdale indicated they can show it to us. So we're going to get a dem demonstration system set up so you can see what it will look like without the customizations in it. And then going beyond that, we want to actually be able to have sessions like this where we, you can come in and try it out. You, you can drive the mouse yourself. And there's other options or drop down fields you want to ask questions about. And you'll be able to do that and get those questions to does that sound like a good starting plan? I'm not, certainly not saying that's the, the entirety of the training plan. Does that sound like a good way to start? Um, as I said, we're going to focus very much on the, the benefits. Um, Carl gave an example earlier um, when he was talking about payroll. But I think part of the problem when you're dealing with a lot of customizations, and in this case we are, undoing some of these customizations and then using the out-of-the-box capabilities requires a lot of technical conversations. The problem with that is that a lot of that detail isn't only not interesting, it's not helpful to you. Like you need to know, how does this actually impact you? What does this mean in terms of comp time? Question four was great. Do I need to still be tracking it manually? 
That's the kind of question that we need to answer. Yes or no, and if there's a change, tell me what it is. So when we conduct these sessions, that's the kind of language we're using. We're talking about things in terms of the benefits to you and what the impact is to you. Now, obviously, this is uh, the second of the road shows that we had. Um, we're hoping that they all continue to be as productive as this one was. Um, the questions that you asked were, were fantastic, and in addition to being able to play back the video, we're also going to write them up and post them to the FAQ site, which I'll mention in just a moment. Um, but we also know that some people, whether it's that they don't have the patience for video or they just prefer to leave text, may in fact want to have a, a list of benefits come out that they can easily scroll through. So we'll continue to publish a newsletter that describes the status of the project and tells you what's happening not only with release one, but as we move on through release two, three, four, all the way through release eight. Um, I thought that the comment around the video streaming was great. We'll have to make sure that we add that on here. And as soon as we have a single site where you can find those recorded sessions, that you'll be able to get to them. Right now, there is actually a site right off the HR page where we have a link for FAQs. So probably the simplest thing for us to do is to add a separate link there where you can see any other sessions that were held and play back those videos. Right, the biggest thing that we need is, is your help with feedback. Um, you've already given us some tremendous help by telling us the kind of things that are on your mind, concerns you have, the questions about how is this going to play out for me, what's this going to mean for the people on my teams. Uh, but we won't know if we're giving you all the information that you need unless we hear back from you. And one of the biggest problems with uh, email, especially when you, you can imagine send out email to a distribution list, is you assume the message got across. Right? And this danger and that assumption that you have a distribution list with 10, <coughs> 50, or 100 people on it, the reality is some people probably haven't even opened the email, and even of those who have opened it, some perhaps haven't got all the way through the bottom. And there's probably some people who have questions about the material that was in the email that didn't take the time to respond. Perhaps they knew that because it was sent to 100 people, they wouldn't get a response. So we want to make sure that we address that as well. If you have suggestions as to how we can communicate more effectively, more succinctly, if there's different topics you want to hear about, uh, as you pointed out earlier, even if there are different ways in which you would like to hear from us, please let us know. Um, We've actually got contact information in this PowerPoint, which we'll be sending to all of you. So you can write directly to us with any questions or suggestions or feedback. Yes. I have one in addition to what you've already laid out as far as communication. I think it's really important um, for communication to go to our president mm -hmm. and our vice president of administrative services because then they can work with the leadership teams to make sure they're working with their managers. Because so you're right, a lot of people get a lot of email, they don't read it, they miss it so that they can at least pose those questions during staff meetings, did you see it? Do you have questions? Um, that's what Dr. Pan did, he resent your e the district email out and encouraged people to come today. I'm not saying everybody's gonna read that either, but it's also very helpful. I think it's a great suggestion. We have already met, I think it's with three or four of the public leadership teams, and we'll continue to meet the leadership teams for the remaining six colleges, um, not only now, for release one, but in subsequent phases of the project as well. Because as you can imagine, what's happening with time and labor is different from what's happening with absence and so what we'd like to be able to do, as we get a little further on here, is give specific guidance for each one of the releases. These are the changes. This is what we're going to do to make it easy for people to understand the impact of the changes. This is, these are the kind of messages you need to be working with your staff on in terms of expectations, Josh mentioned earlier, there will be some changes in policy, and there will be certainly some changes in practice. Two weeks ago, 
and they said that April 15th has nothing to do with accident. Okay. They said April 15th is the date by which if you don't have your ducks in a row and know what you're going to be saying to faculty, then you may as well just wait until the fall because you're not going to be paying attention to your decision. So I'm very aware of that. I appreciate you feeding it. Uh, I'm also aware of the fact that uh, April 15th passed. So we're going to get that information out ASAP. I want to give you a little bit. Like with the CS9, when they came out with the upgrade, they gave us the opportunity to actually come in and test the database system before it actually went live. And we got an opportunity to actually see what changes, like what's it going to look like, um, to play around with the system before I don't want to say go live, but before we actually yeah, so see it, a whole new screen. Yeah, different, it depends. So it depends on what kind of changes we're talking about and different populations. So those so are closer to HR. Yeah, so, so people that are but will general it just it, it depends on which piece of it right. Right. <laughs> I can get by with that I don't know I can't get by if I speak loud and it sounds like I'm upset <laughs> so I think to answer your question I think it really does depend on the release and then what's going to be changed so for payroll calculation, it doesn't make sense to put it up and bring it in a uh, school of testers. One of the things that we encountered though on CS9 by opening it up to so many people is that it made testing extremely difficult because we were having to catch people up from the very beginning up to how to test. So I think we need to address that as a program to see how we get the information out so people can see the screens and the changes without overwhelming them with testing. I think that's my plan. Like they came in and they had slides at least to show us what the different screens were going to look at. Um, so we just didn't have more kind of shock when they came in and saw a whole new. We can absolutely do that instead of bringing in attachments. Yeah. Are you guys doing training like you did the time that month? Yes. Yeah. The short answer is yes. So absolutely. So our goal with this is kind of Christian and Carl and I have to We don't want anybody to be surprised by anything that happens in, it, in any release. We don't want anybody to be in a situation where they need to do something, you know, the day after release and have no idea where it is or what they're supposed to be doing, etc. Our goal is to, to really be uh, right. So all the things that you're you're mentioning are definitely things we have plan. But again, we're going to keep asking for what you need. Uh, we're going to make some judgments. Some things we we think that we can we can the changes are so so small and minute, you know, just a one page handout we can send out to everybody. There's going to be some things depending on your level of use of the system. We're going to need, you know, half day in the lab kind of sessions to walk through the things. So um, we're going to make some calls on those things based off of, you know, our teams and, and all the people that we're engaging the project. Um, but we need to hear from as many people as possible. So like Christian said, we can't take the time whenever, whenever we ask to put those out. Um, our people that, that are kind of in our HR world um, are, are some of the major drivers. So you know, those are good resources for you two to, to get information into. Um, so Allie and Garrett and the team here, Allie was really involved in our um, HR assessment leading up to the project, so she's been um, pretty close to it from, from uh, conception. Um, so, so really, you can reach out to any of us directly throughout the process. So again, our goal is to, to make sure everybody knows what's coming, what it's like, and what you need to do to be able to, to handle it. So yeah, we'll do whatever we can. Integrated in terms of, of where the 
information posted, so the FMS stuff's in the business services area, the ACM's in the HR area. Oh, okay. But we are operating very integrated. We talked about the program, you've heard you mentioned the program a few times. So we're talking about our enterprise systems program, so that's all the, the SIS, uh, ACM, FMS, and EDS. All, all those things. Working very closely as a, as a group to try to coordinate all those activities that are going impacting all of you. Question? I do have a question concerning um, CFS. Because I am in mar marketing, I'm the marketing coordinator for the college, and what I understand right now that's not been communicated very clearly, but we cannot submit any recs for the upcoming fiscal year. So marketing has planned, and we'll be marketing for a college through June 30th, and then since we don't have any opportunity to put in our recs so that we can get the ball rolling again July 1st, which is what traditionally we have done so that we have a seamless um, momentum with our marketing efforts into fall enrollment, everything's going to stop June 30th. And I have not heard of any kind of workaround or anything that can be done so that we can get marketing to continue to roll. So, first of all, let me say, I'm disappointed that you haven't heard that. Let me answer your question. So, for future year purchases, since you can't do a requisition in CFS that will carry forward, you can use your pro card, or if it's a larger type of expense, you can contact purchasing, and they'll give a letter of intent to buy to your vendor so you can continue to do your work. Thank you. And we'll make sure that we uh, reach out appropriately to make sure that that's communicated a little bit. Thank you. So we're right on our end time, so we don't want to hold anybody, but we are more than happy to stay right and answer any questions anybody has. Appreciate your time coming out today, and we will uh, be in touch soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.